I am. My my trusty colleague is unavailable. I, how's this work? How's that? I did want to uh, just come down and give some updates, take some questions. The first thing I'd like to do, obviously, is uh, reiterate the condolences we all feel for the uh, untimely passing of former Congresswoman Tilly Fowler. Uh, the secretary expressed his own condolences. Uh, she was uh, obviously the chairman of the Defense Policy Board, uh, had, had uh, been a trusted source of counsel to us, um, and had taken on some additional assignments that the secretary uh, had asked her to undertake in the course of her tenure uh, with the department. And uh, we extend our condolences to her family. And uh, Mr. Pete Guerin, who is a former member of Congress, uh, and a special assistant to Secretary Rumsfeld will be leading the DOD delegation to a memorial service for uh, former Congresswoman Fowler tomorrow in Jacksonville. Uh, Pete served with her, with Mrs. Fowler, in Congress uh, as a member of Congress himself from Texas uh, and served with her on the Armed Services Committee. There are likely to be other members, other uh, officials in the department uh, going to the uh, memorial service as well. Um, I also wanted to um, just t draw your attention, if you haven't had a chance to see some announcements that CENTCOM put out today uh, regarding uh, the graduations. There were three separate graduations of various components of the Iraqi Security Forces today. Uh, a special, uh, special Weapons and Tactics Training Course graduated 27 SWAT officers today. These are all police graduations. Uh, there was an advanced police training course that completed today of 292 uh, police officers trained in special investigation techniques, uh, those kinds of things. And then uh, the emergency response unit of the police force graduated, to, uh, I believe, 77, or it's correction, 72 police officers today. So uh, as we've said, and as General Abizade, who's in town this week, has testified, the Iraqi security force development continues, uh, and uh, we've seen just today some um, some graduation ceremonies held in in Iraq, and with that, I'd be happy to just give you an update on what's going on and take your questions, Charlie. Um, Larry, the Army Field moved for its recruiting goal uh, last month for the first time in five years, and apparently another sign of uh, of the services having trouble in meeting recruiting and retention goals. I'd like to find out about your concern about that. This building's concern about that. <coughs> And uh, do you plan on increasing the incentives, perhaps increasing the money that's being paid to people to sign up again in order to, to, uh, to address this problem? Well, it, it, the situation of uh, retention and recruitment in both the active and reserve component is something that uh, a great deal of focus is being applied to across the services. But in the Army, obviously, it's a, it's a, a, it's a particularly stressed uh, force. And, and so there is a lot of focus being applied. Uh, these numbers to look at a monthly it tends to be cyclical uh, there are times of the year when 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 the army anticipates uh ups and downs but not that notwithstanding the fact is that they did not meet goals for march and so it is uh something of of focus for the army the army has indeed increased the incentives uh they're hiking enlistment and bonuses en enlistment bonuses from eight thousand to ten thousand Dollars and in some cases to fifteen thousand dollars for unique people with prior enlisted service that have unique specialties skills that we are in higher demand. So there is that's uh, that follows on other recruiting incentives that have been conducted. Uh, they're trying to uh, look at ways to uh, provide incentives in the delayed entry program that might uh, attract people at different timetables according to again this cyclical fashion. So it's something that a lot of focus is being paid. They've increased the number of recruiters by about twenty percent in the United States Army. They've added about 950, 960 recruiters to the total recruiting force. So it's, it's, yes, it is something that we're focused on. The problem, you, you keep saying focused on, is it something you're concerned about? I mean, the problem doesn't seem to be that the number of recruiters it seems to be the fact that you just, the people who go to the recruiters or the, the, the people who the recruiters go to just aren't signing up. It's, it's a like, mixed story, Charlie. It's certainly, uh, it, uh, it is a matter of concern, and, and that's why these kinds of additional steps continue to be taken. At the same time, what we're seeing in terms of retention is that people who are serving, and particularly people who are, have served and deployed, are, uh, are the retention rates are, are staying pretty solid. So people who are in and who understand how things are going and who understand the importance of the work and the, and the, and the, the national service that, they, that they've had the opportunity to, to provide 
are returning. And so that's a so that's a, so it is a mixed bag. Uh, but recruiting is an important component of overall force levels, and uh, n nobody's trying to do anything other than to accept the reality of it. And the reality is that we did not meet goals for this month, and the Army has taken some additional steps to ensure that as this cycle continues, that they can make that up. And they believe they can, by the way. They believe they can make it up for this year. Is it possible that you will increase these incentives? I mean, do you have... Well, I just announced that they... I mean, I'm not announcing it, but I'm just uh, reflecting the that they've Army already done that some and, of that. And, and the Army had increased incentives last month and still right. didn't meet its goals. I think it's something that's always been tuned. I mean, if you've seen... There have been press reports, and I think we've, we've acknowledged, or the Army has, uh, incentives that are uh, appear quite... Uh, impressive for really unique skills, special operators and those kinds of things. It's something that, that, that the Army personnel and generally the services personnel components do a lot. They're always adjusting the incentives, and if they feel that these incentives need to be further adjusted, I'm sure they would do just that. Larry, Larry do, you, do you believe that the explanation for the difficulty in recruiting uh, now is as simple as the fact that um, there's a reluctance of potential recruits to sign up because they know they may face dangerous and difficult duty in Iraq or is there something more complicated going on? I don't know if there's I, I think I think there's a that's a factor that there's that we're a, a nation at war so people have the opportunity they, they uh, I think what we end up seeing a lot of times it's influencers uh, if it's a young kid who's in high school and contemplating his future what are his parents uh, advising him and the army's focused on that and, and wants to help guidance counselors and parents understand uh, what the individual can get from making this decision to join the Army, both in terms of his personal growth as well as his, his, uh, his growth in character, if you will, I mean, his ability to serve the country. Uh, I think you have a strong economy, and that's always, that always makes it a little bit more of a challenge when, there, when the economy is strong. And as we've seen just this week in testimony from the Federal Reserve Chairman, the economy is doing well, and, and uh, that, that's always, uh, that always plays a part in how, how we're able to compete in that economy, and that makes the incentives that much more important because if there's a strong economy, the private sector is providing incentives as well. So there's a lot of factors. There's Conversely, a lot of factors. though, do you believe that uh, <clears throat> as you're more successful in getting Iraqi troops to take over the responsibilities in Iraq and the, the U.S. presence is reduced, do you believe that the recruiting uh, job will be easier? I don't know. I, I, that's a uh, it's a fair enough question. I don't know that anybody's been able to draw that kind of connection. I, I mean, without question, when there's a, uh, the kind of coverage that there has been about uh, casualties, and we certainly mourn all the casualties, and, and there but they are covered. There's prominent media coverage of casualties in Iraq. Parents factor those kinds of things in uh, to what they want their children doing, and parents, I think, are still considered. Uh, in the for the purposes of recruiting one of the strongest influencers in addition to peers on on young young uh, men and women so yeah Nick Larry um, the IAEA in its latest report on Iran is speaking about um, Iran uh, big, uh, digging tunnels to um, house or conceal nuclear components things of that nature um, and this is of concern to them how much of a concern is this to you and if it is a concern what militarily should be done about it? Uh, let me not speak about Iran in particular. The, the White House spokesman made comments on this very point today, and I don't think I, I need to do anything to add or detract from what he may have said. Uh, let me speak to the issue generally, and the issue of, 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 uh, of work being done underground around the world is a, is a, is a, is a, is a growing fact uh, that makes intelligence gathering uh, that much more of a challenge. The technology exists that uh, can dig uh, tunnels the length of a basketball court and twice the height of a basketball net in a day. Uh, that much progress can be made in a day. Uh, that technology is readily available in the commercial markets. So uh, countries that wish to conceal their activities can do so if they're willing to make the investments in the technology that allow them to do that. Uh, so it's, it's a challenge at a time when uh, a, a lot of there are countries that wish to conceal their activities. So again, I don't want to speak. We're on a path that's been well described by the Secretary of State and the President with respect to Iran, and there's nothing that I need to add from from here. The, the issue, though, this seems to take the Iranian um, activity a step further. And does it make Iran more of a threat now, if if it is building a nuclear weapon? The fact that they could be concealing what they're doing from 
either a, uh, an attack or from surveillance? Again, I, I, just, I just don't have any, I mean, you can draw your own conclusions, the, but as I've said, countries that wish to uh, tunnel underground are doing it for a reason. And uh, uh, it, is a, it, is, it is a concern uh, a, a, around the world uh, that if countries want to hide their activities from the, the technical capabilities that, that uh, we and other countries have, uh, they're they're able to do that, but I am in no position to discuss anything specifically with respect to Iran. Larry, yeah, Rick. Can I ask you about the um, the fact that the casualty rate in Iraq for U.S. troops um, for February was apparently the lowest that it's been since last July. I wonder how significant you think that is, and what's your analysis of why uh, the number has gone down? Uh, does it what does it represent? Well, the commanders have spoken about. Uh, they're, they're the fact that the insurgencies are becoming, their, their capability is becoming somewhat cruder in, its, in their ability to anticipate and target because their intel the coalition's intelligence is getting better. And, and one of the reasons it's getting better is because there are more and more Iraqi security forces directly involved in uh, counterinsurgency activities. So uh, it may well be associated with that. Uh, there, there's a we saw demonstrations uh, by Iraqis uh, in in uh, Hilla against the insurgency as a result of that large bomb that tragically killed over 100 people. So I think you're seeing also a growing public uh, uh, opposition to and more and people more willing to make uh, public their opposition to the insurgency, and that's almost certainly having an effect on the ability of the insurgents to operate with some with with impunity. So I think there's a lot of factors. Well, um do you think that uh, the insurgents have changed their tactics? Are they targeting more Iraqis? It appears they are. It appears they're targeting. I mean, the the bombing in Hilla is a is is just one example, but it's a very dramatic example. Uh, it's the second largest bombing since we've been involved in this activity. Were there fewer attacks on U.S. forces? I don't know about the specific numbers. Those numbers are knowable. I just don't know them. And I, if we have them, we can provide the actual numbers of attacks on on coalition forces. But it. There's no question that there are at least uh, a steady state, if not a growing number of attacks against innocent Iraqis, Iraqi civilians. And just one more point. Do sure. You, do you take this as a trend? Do you expect it to continue to decline? or We would certainly hope that it does, but hope is not a plan. And what we're, we're doing is working closely with the Iraqi security forces, letting the Iraqis increasingly uh, involve themselves in the counterinsurgency, the intelligence gathering. and, and uh, we believe that that plan will allow us to gradually uh, see, see this shift in overall responsibility to Iraqis, and if that's the case, there will, by definition, be fewer coalition forces out in front, and, and, and uh, we certainly would expect over time that, that that could tip the security balance in the country. Larry? Jim? Yeah, Larry, up just to build on. Uh, I'll come, Jim, I'll come back to you, Bob. This, okay, Go ahead, just Jim. to build on that. The question there: How how many Iraqi for and the statements you had at the beginning? What are the sizes of the Iraqi forces now? Yeah, uh, we were at 140 last week, and I'm afraid that I don't have a current data, but that data is available, and, and I just don't have it with me. And I should I should, but I don't. I gave you those three numbers, so I obviously begged the question, but we'll get it to you. Uh, yes, sir. In response to Rick's question, you you said something about how the insurgents have been limited to a more crude or cruder approach or something like that. What did you mean by the, that? Uh, some of the commanders have talked about how they've seen some of the IEDs are less sophisticated but more powerful, uh, which means maybe their their ability to, uh, to th their own intelligence, their ability to, to time their, their strikes is, is maybe interrupted because of our ability to intercept or our ability to interrupt their activities. And, and so it's just an, it's, it's an observation that our commanders have made. I think we've actually talked a little bit about it from here. General Rodriguez has spoken a little bit about it. So in some cases, more powerful bombs, but less precise and less, uh, less uh, able to, to time and target the way that they were before. To U.S. offensive actions or intelligence I think there's a range of things that one might attribute it to. I mean, there, the intelligence is without question getting better. I think there's no question that we have uh, uh, apprehended or killed an enormous number of insurgents. So just, I think you may well, we may well be seeing people who are less skilled at what they're doing because they, they may be, it could well be that they're recruiting, they're, they're continuing to recruit, but these, are, these may not be as peop, people as well experienced. This is speculation, but there are a lot of suggestions that indicate what the commanders have said. 
Yeah, Pam. I have uh, two questions unrelated to each other. Um, the first one is, can you give us more detail on how the handover of Saddam Hussein's brother-in-law happened? How, how did Syria catch him? Why did they do it? How long did they have him? W were there any conditions of his handover? And has it improved relations uh, with the U.S. military in Syria there and maybe between our governments? I, I'm, I'm not in a position. Uh, did you actually have two questions? Yeah. That, well, that, that sounded like several questions. Well, that, that one question made up of several sub-questions? One sub -questions. run on <laughs> sentence with several commas. On okay. it. The second question is on the ACLU um, lawsuit that was filed against Secretary Rumsfeld. It was both as SecDef and as a citizen. So I think they're hoping to go after some of his private assets to compensate um, who they say the, the alleged victims of U.S. torture. Um, it, w what's the legal arrangement you all have here? Is the general counsel going to uh, represent him? Uh, will he also have a private sector attorney? Let me take them in order. Syria, I don't have anything. I mean, I, what I can uh, comment, which I think we've already generally acknowledged, is that there was U.S. forces involved in 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 uh, transporting the individual to his location inside of Iraq. Uh, how those arrangements were made and, and, and who was involved in making those arrangements is beyond the scope of anything that I'm privy to, and I'm not in a position to comment on them. I can only acknowledge that there were U.S. forces involved in transporting and ultimately securing the individual. And, and you might, I don't know, uh, I would just refer you to the State Department to see what they might be saying about what arrangements may have occurred, but I, we're not, I'm not, a, I'm not aware of any, and I'm not involved in them. We weren't involved in them, to my knowledge. And the lawsuit? The lawsuit. Uh, the, 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 this is a matter, as, as, a, as an official of this government operating in his f official capacity, uh, the Secretary uh, is represented by the Department of Justice, in a matter of speaking. So it's the Justice Department that is going to evaluate this claim and uh, determine what the steps going forward are. Uh, we're, through the General Counsel's Office, very closely uh, uh, connected to the Justice Department. Uh, there are aspects of it that, uh, that uh, are, being, are still being considered, how, how, how best to approach this. I would like to just reiterate what we said when this claim was made, and that's that we just continue to vigorously uh, reject any uh, assertion or implication that any of the policies that were approved inside the department or, or by the commanders, General Sanchez approved policies in Iraq, were intended to be policies of abuse. And in fact, none of the investigations that have been conducted concluded that there was a policy of abuse. I should say it more positively, all of them concluded that there was no policy of abuse. So uh, we just, uh, there's just no basis for the, any of these claims. But again, it's the Justice Department that will determine the way forward on this. Just one brief follow-up. I'm sorry, to a question if I may. Um, I, I don't, I don't know, you operate in the highest levels of this film, the highest echelons of this film. I mean, how can you say you're not privy to how the U.S. forces transported this guy from the border. Uh, I, I mean, you can't give any details on how this, this On how the U.S. forces transported to the border? Right. From, and, and I mean, who from the border? I mean, was it a squad of, a, of, of Syrian soldiers? Was it, was it a high-level exchange at a border post? I mean, you, you don't know that? Or? I don't know that, as a matter of fact. What I know is that U.S. forces inside of Iraq gained custody of this individual and took him to where he went. And beyond that, I just don't know. So, could you could you take the question and maybe um, Brian? Uh, I think I think we've uh, <coughs> Brian knows if Brian knows we'll let Brian tell you. I just don't I don't have any detailed understanding of what happened other than what I've described, which is that U.S. forces were involved in transporting him inside Iraq. Yep. I mean, even if you even if 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 you would rather have the State Department discuss how it, how it was done politically, mm -hmm. could you physically yeah. fill us in on it? Uh, Take the question physically how he was, I'll see what, how he was turned I'll see over what can and transferred. And, and then, f having learned what can be learned, I'll see what can be disclosed. I think you guys should be excited about this because after so much pressure on Syria and saying how bad they're being, they're being good. So it's a good news story, Larry. I'd like you to get it out there. The uh, current Iraqi security forces is 141,761. That's, again, the categories that we've discussed, not including facilities protection service.
Larry, just back to the Syria thing for a second. Yeah. Just at the end of your answer to Pam's question, I think you said we were not involved. Uh, could you just? Uh, all I know is what I said. I mean, the, they were U.S. We were involved to the extent that there were U.S. forces that got a hold of this guy and took him to where he was going. But that's 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 that all I have. We were any not kind involved. Doesn't apply to anything that might have happened inside Syria. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I'm not trying to. Please don't don't. No, no, I'm not, because that that would to say yes or no to that would would be saying yes or no to the concept of negotiations. All I'm saying is what I said. U.S. forces moved this guy from a place to another place inside of Iraq. I can't help you on anything beyond that. I just can't. Larry, the president today talked about Osama bin Laden and how everything was still being done in the pursuit of him. Can you tell us whether any military assets have been diverted from Afghanistan to Iraq to fight the insurgency there, specifically around the Iraqi elections? Um, uh, there has been movement back and forth for over the course of the period that we've been involved in both countries. Uh, the, the general level of forces inside of uh, Afghanistan, I think, uh, has been something on the order of three brigades plus a division headquarters, uh, plus or minus 17,000. Any other assets, whether it's equipment, UAVs, oh. or other? Uh, General Abizade is the combatant commander. He has responsibility for both those areas, those theaters of operation. Uh, he he knows what he is trying to accomplish. His military objectives are, and and I don't doubt for, and I think he's talked about this. He moves resources around as necessary, but he has never felt that he didn't have the resources he needed in any given theater for the mission at hand. You don't believe in any way that the mission to find Bin Laden has in any way been compromised, or there's been any shortcomings to help fight the insurgency in Iraq. I don't believe General Abizade thinks that. I don't believe General Barno thinks that. I think they feel like they've had what they've needed to conduct the mission at hand, and the mission at hand is Taliban, Al Qaeda, and uh, the hunt for Mullah Omar, other high value targets, including uh, Mullah Omar and Osama bin Laden. And they've said that they've had what they needed when they needed it. Can I ask the same question a little differently? <laughs> do, you, do you know specifically whether surveillance assets that were in Afghanistan were moved to Iraq? To help surveil I don't the know. Situation during the election period. I do not know, and if it's if if we can find out, I don't know. Did this come up in General Abizade's hearing at all? Maybe he talked about it a little bit. You could read the transcript. Yeah. Uh, if if it's something, I, I would only say that it wouldn't surprise me. But that's again, that's a decision that the combatant commander and the theater commanders are, are making all the time, and they base it on what they need and where they need it. And they, if they needed more, they'd ask for more. So, right, yeah, uh, the uh, drop in the sophistication of the IEDs, mm -hmm. could that be because you're having better success in targeting bomb makers? There's been a lot of t uh, effective targeting of bomb makers. There's been a lot of apprehension of bomb makers. There's been a lot of apprehension of bomb laboratories. They've, they've rolled up bomb making equipment and, and, and uh, uh, inventory. So all of the above, I guess, is what I'd say, yeah. And it, so, therefore, it could be related. I, there's, I don't know how you prove that, but. And so, on the part of the intelligence people, though, that that the sort of the, the number of bomb makers is getting down to the point where uh, it's having a noticeable effect on their ability to set up IEDs. And, and it's possible. I suppose that's the implication of what I said, but I don't know that I've heard anybody put it quite that way. They just what some of the commanders have have noted, and what we've talked about from here is is the observation that the bombs. Uh, they, they're having more success at the percentage of bombs that they capture before they go off, and the ones that are going off, in, to some extent, are less sophisticated than they once were, but in some cases more powerful. I guess that's the way they've described it. Thanks. Uh, di different subject. It's been reported that the uh, Comparative Testing Office is sending a delegation to Taiwan this weekend. The, the which testing? The Comparative Testing Office. Okay. Is that a DOD office? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. And uh, they're sending a delegation to Taiwan to evaluate the possibility of secure, procuring military supplies and equipment there. I'm wondering if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about this delegation, and do you think this represents an increasing trend to forge military-to-military -military ties with Taiwan? I cannot say anything more about it, but we'll see what we can learn about it and uh, provide that information. Great. Thank you. Yeah. The Hilla bombing was not an isolated incident. There's been a whole series of attacks on Iraqi recruits as well as uh, Iraqi soldiers and police. How is it that such a situation is allowed to happen where you have over 100 people in a vulnerable situation that can all get hit at once by a car bomb? Have you ever been to Hilla? It's a big city. And if a guy comes up in a truck and he's willing to die, you could kill a lot of people. But aren't there force protection measures that can be put in place? Is that a U.S. responsibility or an Iraqi responsibility? It's uh, security in that country is what we've described. There are, there's a growing involvement of Iraqi security forces and the obvious role that coalition forces play. But uh, 
for the concept of force protection in the middle of a big city is a different concept than what you may be describing, which is a military force defending itself. This was in the, this was in the middle of a large city. Are, are any new efforts being made to figure out ways to try to? Prevent it's something that, kind of that they're they're always evaluating how how best to protect the the the. the the Iraqi population increasingly, as I said, it's an Iraqi police and an Iraqi security force responsibility. But again, if somebody's willing to kill themselves, as we saw in 9/11, they can kill an enormous number of people. And and I don't and you and it's difficult to to defend against that kind of attack. Why don't we take one more? Uh, let's go to the Middle East again. Uh, the the commander of the Israeli Air Force said this week that uh, the IAF is ready to hit terrorist targets inside Syria after the suicide the bombs in Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. My question is, if this happened, does the DOD support this action? I, I didn't see the comments that you're referring to. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to reflect on the comments made by an another, another government official and speculate on what those comments would mean. So it's just, it's, uh, uh, there's an awful lot of that situation right now is very dynamic in in that part of the Middle East, and uh, uh, there's a peace process in place, but the peace process is associated with uh, with what appears to be popular sentiment that uh, the situation in a couple of those countries is is uh, one that deserves consideration by the public and so that's happening and it's 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 difficult for us to comment on how, what's happening other than to say that uh, uh, there is a there is a uh, a peace process that we support and uh, and then we have bilateral relations with countries in that region that uh, we've made our points bilaterally mm -hmm. I mean, the, uh, the uh, secretary rice said this week in uh, I think in Brussels that uh, there is, uh, I mean, clear proof that uh, Syria, that Damascus is behind this attack. Mm -hmm. So well, I don't have anything to add to Secretary Rice's comments. Last Secretary question. Larry, is the, is the Secretary Hale and, and Hardy? Is he, is he what? He had someone of the cool on He picked up this bug that's going around. Uh, he's been in uh, pretty much every day. In fact, he's been in every day. As far as I know, he might have, he was here when I came down here. So it's 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 just been one in which he's tried to limit his contact with people a little bit because he's he's been sick. But he's been if uh, if the volume of snowflakes is any metric. He hasn't. He hasn't been down and out. We could see well, got somebody to give to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Would you down here next week? It would be nice. It would be. Wouldn't okay. It? Yeah. Fresh on. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for dropping by. Thank you. Part of my New Year's resolution. <laughs> <laughs>